Hello and welcome to Jack Myers Ministries and Life Family Church Podcast. Be blessed by this week's message. Gave to you tonight. There is no failure in you. It is not possible for you to fail. We have failed many times, Lord, and we thank you, Jesus, that you share your success with us. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness and that your mercies are new. We yield ourselves to the word and spirit tonight, and we say we have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that are open to perceive and receive the truths of your word that we leave transformed in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you can receive that. I love being with the Wednesday night crowd. You're like the ride or die people come out on on Wednesday night Bible study. (laughs) Okay, so go with me in your weapons manual. Tonight's title is Yes and Amen. So we could say it like this. uh, God is the yes and you're the amen. So we're going to talk about what that looks like. Andrew, where's my, uh, oh, there it is. Okay, thank you. My object lesson. Don't you love visual aids? I mean, like show and tell, PE and lunch were the best parts of school. So, uh, Go with me in your, in your weapons manual to 2 Corinthians 1.20. But, um, you know, in laying pipelines, has anybody ever seen, this is a PVC pipe. So anybody ever driven by anything or seen uh, them laying pipes? Usually they're bigger on the side of the road or you're seeing a house being built and, and they're digging trenches and laying pipelines, etc. Well, we want to talk tonight about what this looks like in the spirit and the spiritual principle of it. So when you got saved... The excavation process began in your life. And I think we talked about this Sunday night, how we always want to uh, decorate, but God needs to excavate first and how kind of that's not the fun, that's the dirty part, the costly part. It's not the pretty part. Or we want to, um, I should have said it this way, we want to decorate and God needs to renovate, but uh, we want to put landscaping in and God's like, no, we got to excavate. We got to get a backhoe and we got to dig this up and we got to lay pipelines and principles. So uh, God provides the grace and the ability for us to access the, the supply line. So heaven has the supply, yes? And we know it's ours, but there is a conduit or a pipeline with which we get it to flow from the spiritual realm to the natural realm. So we could view it like in the natural, uh, water is available. But it's not going to come to your house unless you have a pipe that connects you to the source of supply, yes? So you have to have something, whether you have uh, water flowing in or you have an electrical conduit. Electricity may be available down at the power plant, but it won't flow automatically into your house without the proper conduit, amen? So even though as a Christian, the supply of heaven is available to us, is it automatic, No, we have to understand what the pipeline is and how to turn that water on to get that supply to flow freely to us. So uh, we we have to build uh, our lives on this. So the the first point is we're going to look at, we're going to go to the Word. We could say it this way if you're writing notes. This is the builder's manual. So in here are the specs for the conduits, the pipelines, the foundation, the walls, the sheetrock, just like you would get a builder's manual or set of blueprints. This is the building uh, manual blueprint uh, for your lives. So we're going to go to the word because it's a builder's manual. Grace is the pipeline, number one, through which our faith flows. So I, I say this often, you bring your faith to his grace. So your job is not the grace. Your job is the faith. God's job is not the faith. His job is the grace. And so the grace is your ability to obtain the faith. So in other words, God has to provide the grace. So we could say it as simply as this. Grace is the pipeline, but your faith is the water that's flowing through there. He's going to provide the pipeline for you, but if you don't lay it and know your part, to get that to turn on, there, it won't be a flow in your life just because the pipe's laying in the trench. You may have pipes under your house, uh, but they may not be working properly. So even the presence of a pipe does not guarantee there is a flow, yes, into our lives from it. So in uh, 2 Corinthians 1.20, if you're there, in the King James, it says this, for all the promises of God, circle this, in him. So first of all, it's telling us what position you need to be in to receive the promises. Because what we want to do go is all the promises of God in him. Wait a minute. 
all the promises of God are in a place and you have to be in that place. Does that make sense? So the place is in him. In other words, this is in the covenant, in the right standing, in the house of God, not outside of that. All the promises of God in him are yes. That means you don't have to ask him if you can have some. He's already said yes. Like when you go to your mom and dad, can I have a cookie? This is what I say to people. The answer is yes. Now what's the question? God's already said the yes, so we don't, we don't have to say, may I? He said, yes, he's going to let you know, though, that you have to participate in receiving that. Uh, so if, if I ask my mom for a cookie, may I have a cookie, mom? Yes. And I stand there. She's like, what are you waiting for? What's wrong with you legs? <laughs> like, oh, you thought, you thought I was going to get up and bring you the cookie. <laughs> now, you asked me if you could have a cookie. You know where they are. Go, in other words, you will have to make your effort. I gave you permission, but, but permission isn't mean I'm going to get it. I still have to walk in the cupboard and go get the cookie. Thank you, Mom. I'm going to go get the cookie, right? Okay, so if God has laid something up, he's like, here it is. And the answer is yes, it's yours. But you're going to have to put some effort in, okay? Your faith has got to meet his grace. There, uh, yes, and notice it says, in him... Amen. Two different things. Remember, no synonyms. They are yes in him and they are amen in him. So we need to pay attention that he's talking about two different things. And then it says, to the glory of God by us. Mm. God is, has an opportunity here to get glory by me. So I want to really pay attention to any verse that says, my participation gives him glory. Because I'm looking that, that he be glorified, right? So if we read it in the Amplified, it says, for as many as are the promises of God, in other words, there are many, they all find their yes answer. Okay, so yes is an answer. What do I have to say? The word yes. If my child says, can I have a cookie? Mental telepathy, are you getting me? The word yes, God is saying here, is, is it's, it's an answer. It's not a thought. It's not a meditation of your heart. It's an out loud answer. The same thing God how created the world, that he created the world by going, I thunk it into existence. I spoke it. Amen. So I have to say the words yes, Right? It helps you not think no, say no. If I'm saying yes, I can't say no at the same time. That'll help some of you with that, that think no is okay. Um, as many of the promises, they all find their yes answer in him, which is Christ, which is the anointing. The yes comes before the anointing. If you want to have more of the anointing, which is the painted on, smeared on, ability to God on your inability, the power of God, you will have to say yes to access it. You can't go, well, God, let me have a little bit of that anointing and then I'll let you know if I want to do that or not. Uh, yeah. There aren't business deals and negotiations with God. Amen. See, it's a, a theocracy, not a republic or a democracy. Yeah. His way is the highest way. That's why it's his way or the highway. But it is the highest way. For this reason, we also utter the amen. Notice it says utter the amen. The word amen, write this down, means so be it. So when we say amen in church, we're saying whatever pastor just said from the word, so be it in my life. If you don't answer, tells you what can be so, not what will be so. My yes answer, so be it. Yes, amen, in my life makes it so. God's word in my ears tells me what can be so. Amen. His word in my mouth makes it so. Amen. If you leave off the answer out loud out of your mouth, nothing's getting done. Just tells me the pipeline's here, the water's available, but nothing's getting done. Nobody turned the faucet on. All right, we just want God to do everything for us when he already has. It says, for this reason also we utter the amen, so be it to God, my answer to him, through him in his person and by his agency to the glory of God. That means when I say yes, so your words, so be it in my life as you have spoken it, he is glorified simply by that. Why? That's an act of faith. Amen. Because I, know, I already know I can't do it. He said, without me, you can do nothing. So I don't have to camp on the I can do nothing. But in me, you can do all things. 
all things. So all he's asked for is my yes, which is my faith. Father, I've never done that before. I've never seen it. I don't even know what it looks like, but thanks. Thank you for the honor of the ask. The honor that you have honored me with your ask will receive back to you the honor of my yes. You will never hear no, because that would be dishonorable for me to do to the king. He thought enough of me to ask, which means he thinks I'm capable and it doesn't matter what I think. Yeah, we have to look at things through the perspective of authority, not ours, right? Okay, because God's thoughts are right. His feelings are right. His perspective is correct. In fact, he doesn't have a perspective. He has truth. You have a perspective, which is neither fact or truth and highly faulty and clouded. Paul said, you see, you see through a glass and darkly at that. So in other words, your glasses are really dirty. God's word tells us all that he has ordained to be so in our lives, but it only becomes so when we agree with him. You can't agree with him mentally. That's called mental assent because faith is a verb. It requires an action. It requires voice and hands. It's voice activated and then action is put to it to cause it to happen. Yes? Uh, kind of like an electrical conduit. I'm, I'm not an expert in that, but I, re- I realize that there is a switch on the wall that goes up for on and down for off unless someone uh, had a lack of excellence and put it upside down, which a, lo- a lot of times happens, cold and hot or switch and up down because they just didn't care. Um, and so with the, the electricity, I'm clearly aware, is available because I can see the light switch. But until I walk over there with my action, believing in what I cannot see is present and flip it on, the lights don't come on automatically. Mm-hmm. I realize even if, well, I have an Alexa, I just talked to it, you still answered. Yeah. It's your Alexa is still voice activated. Yes. Amen. Yeah. And then uh, she has an answer too. Like, don't be talking to me that way, girl. I, cha- I change you to, to, to a guy. I don't like that girl. <laughs> so it becomes so we agree. Say the truth and stay firm in the truth. And when it manifests, it's to bring glory to him. Amen? So amen is a verb. In other words, everybody remembers in school, a verb is an action word. So it's not a dormant thing. It it has a movement to it. It signifies to confirm, establish, and verify. In English, it's generally used at the end of declarations and prayers in the sense of be it firm, be it established. So we say yes, and so be it to establish that in our lives. We, we need to not sit in, we need to say amen, but when we're sitting in church and amening it, you need to understand what you're amening and what it means because if you're amening because it's something we do and you have no faith with, mixed with it, it's not activated. It's just a religious saying. And some people like to say it louder than everybody else, but that doesn't make it work more. Amen. So he's the yes, because he said all the pro- his promises are yes, and, but you are the Amen. You must be the amen for his yes to be so in your life. When we ask God for something, every time what he does is he's like, come on over, love. Let me show you how to lay that pipeline. Mm -hmm. We're like, oh, I thought you were going to get the shovel and do that for me. (laughs) No, I'm going to show you how. Nothing wrong with your arms. Get the shovel, darling. Dig over here and lay that pipeline. See, we ask God for stuff thinking he'll do it for us when he said, I've already done it. Jesus went to the cross, finished his earthly ministry, and he said, I sat down at the right hand of the Father. I sat down and you got off your butt. Jesus' work is finished. It is finished. Yours just got started at the cross. So you may have knelt at the cross, but you got up and got to work. Because Paul said, I'll show you my faith by my works. And faith without works is dead. So the reason Jesus is finished is because he passed the job to you. Tag, you're it. So he sat down. Why? Because he said, now I got to make intercession for you. And I'm going to send you the helper, the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost is not going to take the shovel out of your hand either. Remember the word for the Holy Ghost is helper, standby, advocate helping you, not do it for you. Amen. People are like, oh, I thought I was going to ask him and he was going to do it for me. No, you were going to ask him how and he was going to tell you how and then you were going to commence to do it and he would guide you. No, no, dig over there. You know, the baton, dig in, dig out, put the dirt over there. 
So he was going to lead you as you went along and coach you into accuracy. He was not going to pick up the shovel and do it for you. Why? The grace is sufficient. It's on the inside of you. He doesn't have the grace. He leads you into the grace and into the truth. But you, you have to participate. This is why it's a partnership in our lives. And so if you, if you don't do your part of the partnership, not only do you receive that, but you miss out on all the fun. You miss out on all the blessing. You have no purpose in life if somebody's doing everything for you. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Just seeing if you're listening. <laughs> so he's going to show you how to lay the foundation. Now remember this. God only ex excavates and renovates. You're going to do the decorating landscaping. Okay, but you have to partner with him. So what he does is that, that he's going to help you. So we could say this, number two, uh, you out loud answer the yes, and then God does the performing. Why does he do the performing? Because it's his word you put in your mouth. Now, if you say things that are not in God's word, is he obligated to perform that? No. Absolutely. He can't perform it. He's not only not obligated, he's not going to do it because he won't violate his own word. So you have to, be, you have to go to God on chapter and verse. Lord, you said, he said, put me in Malachi, put me in remembrance. He loves it. I'm standing on this word. I'm putting it in my mouth. Standing is putting it in my mouth. So if you come forward and say, I'm believing God, you need to have your scripture. I'm believing God for this so that you need to have your scripture or multiple scriptures for what you're believing God for. You can't be standing on a covenant and you can't give a yes answer of the verse you're standing on. Because when we go to court in Simpson, don't we say uh, law number one, paragraph whatever, 500 and number 1701? We know with which we are standing on. We'll be, when we go before a natural court, we better have the law, the chapter, the verse, the page number, and it could be, you know, 1701F. You better know what you're standing on. Same thing with the Word of God. It's really simple. We're going to put that in our mouth, and then God is obligated to fulfill His Word, not ours. Does that make sense? Yes. Really easy. Makes it very simple. So if we're, we're doing some building, first of all, what they do is they have to dig a hole because we go, we want to build something pretty and new. And we're like, well, what are you doing? We're, you're going wrong, the wrong way. You're digging down. And you're like, aren't we supposed to be building up? Yeah, but to, the higher you want to go, the deeper the hole. And that's the part we don't like. Well, we're not going to say the deeper the hole. Why? Because you've got to put the rebar in, the, the bigger the foundation, the concrete you're pouring. You've got taller rebar because you want the structure to, to be long and strong, right? We don't want to have four years because it took 120 days to throw the house up. Four years later, the stucco's falling off the wall. Yeah. And a lot of other things are going on because we were in a hurry to slam it and jam it, right? God is building... Um, He's not building your bank account. He's building a man. Amen. So he's going to work from the inside out and everything. You're asking, you're asking him to hurry up. I want a cookie. I want a piece of candy. And I want you to do this, do this, do this. And he's going to build the man. Amen. And that takes a little bit longer. But the reason it takes longer, because we're generally kicking against it. We, no, 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 no excavating today. We're just landscaping. God's like, we're not done excavating. Uh. No, we're, paint, we're painting today, God. No, we're not. We're, we're demoing sheetrock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when we resist against God building the character and the foundation in our life with which these pipelines and conduits are laid, all we're doing is delaying it or say, I don't want one of those houses that withstands the storm because I'm just in a hurry. And, and there's no reason to be since you're an eternal being and you're going to live forever and we have ages to come and you're the same you and you're going to get to learn and grow. So I, I don't mean as in there's no hurries and a herd of turtles moving through chunky peanut butter, okay? <laughs> Some people just need to get a new pair of running shoes and, and pick up the pace a bit. Uh, but we have trenches and foundations. But what, what happens after the very first phase a building, and again, I just watch HTTV, I don't know this, but you guys know this. So they're going to dig a hole, lay a foundation, and they're going to dig some trenches, and then we do what? We seek inspection. <gasps> Why would I do that? I don't want my pastor to tell me or my boss to tell me I didn't do that right. So we want to cover it up. 
We want to hide things from the inspector. But every part of the building process, especially the first one, we don't cover any pipelines. We don't cover anything up. We want the inspector to come and inspect every detail. Why? To make sure before it's covered up that it's done right. Because if we got to drill through the foundation, through your beautiful hardwood floors, through the foundation to fix a pipe that was leaking because it wasn't done properly, we're talking a lot more time and money. Um, if you don't have time to to do it right the first time, you don't have right time to fix it the second time. So that's what we want, God. What we want to do is seek inspection. But what we do is running around avoiding inspection, hiding from authority, trying to have our boss on and say, saying, please look at my project. How about check my paper, somebody, before I turn it in to the person who's going to grade it because I care what it looks like. Somebody inspect it because I want it to be excellent. I want it to be finished. And when... Um, Remember when God gave Moses the job of the tabernacle and he delegated everybody their part? He said, now when I come, I won't come in if it's not perfect like I asked. I'm going to inspect every detail. And he looked it up one side, down the other, and he said, you've done it exactly as I've asked you. And what happened? The glory. Where are the needs met? In the glory. You want the glory. The glory doesn't come in to slam it and jam it lives. The glory comes into it's excellent. Now you can cover that up and we can go on to phase two, right? So we pour the concrete, we, the plumber hooks up the sewer and water. What do we do? We're ready for our inspection. We ask for, we seeking, actually seeking inspection. Why we want to be sure it's done right. We want to be sure it's up to code because once we button it all up, we want it to be good to go and we want to enjoy it. We want to enjoy that life. And then we bring other people into that building or that home. Don't we want them to be blessed by it? We, want to, want to, want, we don't want to be 30 days. The lights are starting to flicker. The ceiling's starting to fall on our head. <laughs> you know, little clumps falling all over the place because somebody didn't get it up there right. So then we do rough framing of exterior walls. We're like, okay, now it's good. Now I'm getting to see stuff. We've got these two by fours going up. So when you drive by these new housing sites, we're like, oh, we saw foundation for a long time with all these ugly pipes and nothing seemed to be happening. Why? It was unseen. And then all of a sudden, now we have framework going up. We're like, man, now it's going. And then the roof rafters are, and what do we do? Stop. And we get another inspection. Why? Because before we slam sheetrock on top of these two by fours, we want to make sure they're up to code. Why? So when the, the big bad wolf comes and huffs and puffs and tries to blow your house down, it doesn't blow down. Okay? And so uh, go to Galatians 2.2. 2. So before we put those interior walls up, we want to make sure the electrician has come and, and made sure we put... Um, all of our conduits in the right place, right? Anybody love having somebody come in and uh, go, well, we need to rip some holes in your sheetrock mm -hmm. to fix that problem that somebody else, maybe you inherited, maybe you bought another home? No, not so much fun. So anybody know who the great apostle Paul was? Yeah, very... Uh, probably DC, absolutely, very uh, protocol oriented, very self-disciplined, wrote two thirds of the New Testament. We find him seeking inspection for himself. That's humility. So Galatians 2.2 2 says this, Paul says this, I went because it was specially and divinely revealed to me that I should go. What is he talking about? The Lord told him 14 years into his ministry to go back to Jerusalem. He'd been out in Turkey and very far places when you're traveling by foot or boat. And it was time to return to Jerusalem to seek inspection. But he said the Holy Ghost revealed to him he needed to do this. There's somebody that was led. Because most people are saying, no, the Holy Ghost would never lead me to seek inspection. And a lot of times people will go, oh, you can tell me, tell me, tell me if you see anything. Like pastor and I fall for that like we were born yesterday. <laughs> yeah, don't even bother to say that to somebody because that means you're really not safe for them to do it. Um, I, before the gospel, he said, I should go. And I put before them the gospel. Paul felt like it was his own gospel. And he said, look, I've been out there in the mission field far away for 14 years, and I need you to inspect my paper. I need you to tell me I've been preaching this. And he said he held it to the Jerusalem council. 
for their inspection. And then he said, I went privately, Peter, James, and John. He, said, he didn't really know who they were. He's not one of the 12 original apostles. He said, they seem to be the leaders. It wasn't, oh, they're the great leaders. Oh, I would do anything Brother Hagen told me to do. Yeah, well, that's great, but he's not here and he's not God. So how about just your boss or your pastor or you know your parents or whatever? And so Paul said, and this is why I said, he said, I want you to inspect this lest I have run in vain. For 14 years, he wanted to make sure he was an expert. He had a double PhD, but he still said, I seek your inspection. I don't even know you, but I, cl- I see God has put you in authority. I must know that I'm not running in vain. Whew. You don't have great power without great humility to seek inspection. I remember when I was in uh, cosmetology school where the Lord sent me, not on my bucket list, and um, I was maybe a little, just a little bit older than the, the average age that would come in there. And so um, the instructors, when you got out of pre-clinic and were allowed to touch somebody's real hair on the floor, uh, they would say, you know, uh, you're gonna formulate your color, your charts, whatever you learn, and then come ask us if you have any difficulty. So they were always available on the floor. And so I would watch the other students go to, uh, and I still remember their names, Miss Judy and Miss Marla, and ask them to tell them how to do it. But they were already supposed to know. So I would go to them and say, this is what I've got, and this is my formula. And if I'm wrong, just tell me I'm wrong. Do not give me the right answer. I will go back and I will reformulate with what you taught me. I will check the charts, I will check the books, and then I will come back to you. So sometimes it would take me up to three times. You would just look at it and, and they wouldn't, no one else asked for that. They just wanted them to do it. They'd go over there and do it because, you know, they don't care. They get a paycheck at the end of the day. Um, and I said, no, because you're not going to be here when I'm out in the real world. And I'm, I'm here to learn this. I'm not here to act like I know something I don't know and go out there and jack up people's hair and they'll need a $300 color correction for a $30 color service. Eventually I became that person that did that. And so, I mean, the $300 color corrections for the $3 box color. Um, So I said, and sometimes it would be three times, and then she'd say, yes, that's correct. But that's how I learned. Inspection, inspection. I do not want the answer. You taught me how to get the answer, and I will go back and back. And if I'm stumbling and I'm not able to write, and by the third time, sometimes she'd be like, let's go back to the chart together. She knew I wanted her to re-walk me through whatever step I was missing, but I didn't ask for the answer. I don't want the answer. I want to do what you've taught me to do. So we want to seek, why? Because I care to not be flagrant about the person sitting in my chair. That even though they'd only paid $5 because this is a school, I wanted to honor their bravery (laughs) and not treat them like they're a second class citizen. Your courage should be rewarded because that's all, that, that's all they had. And so they had come to the school for that. And that was disrespectful to just treat them like they were not worthy of my utmost best. Because I learned to fix what everybody else let walk out of there. So then when we're in a building process, have you ever seen a team building or again on HGTV? And, and at some point they're like, okay, we're all gonna sit down and we're gonna have a Coke and a sandwich, right? At some point in building, we get rest and refreshment because it's hard work. And so God gives us these pauses. He said, he leads us beside still waters in Psalms 23, what? To restore our soul. And a lot of that comes from the body, enjoying a meal with each other, hearing people's testimonies. How's your building process going? Little little on the painful side, but thank you for asking. Yeah, how how, how did a staple gun go in the wrong direction? It was supposed to go towards the board and went into my thumb. You know, and so we have war stories to share with each other about, but we're running our race together. We're all in in the same boat. Yeah, I know what you mean. That happened to me last week too. And, you know, but isn't it great? Uh, The building, the edifice is rising higher and higher and from glory to glory. So we are going to have times of refueling, but whether we, we see the finished work or not, that's faith. So we're like, we have this blueprint, we have this picture, and this doesn't look anything like it. Anybody ever been in new construction and you're in it and you're like, is this room only four feet by eight? It says 14 by 18, but there's no way this is four. And you're upside down and you're like, well, I know the dining room is over there and you find yourself in the bathroom. It's confusing. You need faith to see the bigger picture. And so when God is in the process of helping you say your yes and amen and building your life, you're gonna have to have trust mixed with that faith or you're not gonna get there. 
Are you sure? Anybody ever had a designer like my, my son, he'll be mixed plaids and florals and paisleys, and you're like, are you sure? No, trust me. And I'm like, I need to see it on a vision board. And I'm like, oh, you're right, that's awesome. But by, no, I don't like that. And it, I don't like that. And no, I don't, I don't see how that would ever work. And so he's like, what? He's the master planner and the designer. Trust me, you're going to have to have some trust. Why? Because you're not the builder, you're the building. <laughs> it's like us telling an architect, well, you don't know what you're doing. Give me that hammer. Give me those plans. Yeah, I know what, I, what we say. Is, I know what I want. I know where I'm going. So we want to yank back the tools and yank. We won't ask for help. We won't ask for directions. It's like telling somebody who knows more. Any of you ever had brain surgery and decided to wake up in the middle of it and tell them they didn't know what they're doing? Give me that scalpel. You don't know what you're doing. I'll just finish it. But we do that every day with God and think nothing of it. In the middle of the bottom, you're like, God, you, just give me that. You're taking too long. Amen. Yeah. So then we put the drywall, the floors, and you know what? This process takes all our lives, but what else you got to do? Some people are in there jackhammering it, crowbarring it, smashing it, and tearing it up as fast as God's trying to build it. They're demoing. They're, Proverbs says you're tearing your own house down with your own hands, and it says it's your mouth. You'll build it and rip it down. Build it and go, yes, amen, in the service. And Monday, you'll rip it back down. And the problem is every time you demo, anybody notice that, that it yanks other stuff out? Yeah. So if you want to go, oh, I just want to smash up the kitchen, be careful, you're probably going to tear up the living room and the dining room and everything attached to it because those, th those things are very destructive. Go to Proverbs 24.3. <coughs> you okay? What are we talking about? Uh, God is the yes and you are the Amen. So are, are part of this building process. And we can, can we make things go faster by cooperating better? Yeah. And trusting and not trying to slow it down because we got to know what, what, what are you doing and why are you doing that? And do, do we have to do it that way? And all these negotiations, right? That slow this process down. Proverbs 24, three through four. Through skillful and godly wisdom is a house, a life, a home, a family built. And by understanding, it is established. What is he talking about? Pipelines, conduits, the building blocks of our lives. On a sound and good foundation, and by knowledge shall its chambers, or its rooms, be filled with precious and pleasant riches. Write this down. If you can't be told, you can't be taught. And so... Uh, you need to be able to be told that seeking inspection. And when somebody tells you, you don't need to be, make it personal. Because when they would tell me, you're not doing that right, thank you for helping my form. Like they're telling you you're not doing it right just because just you're just being picked on. How ludicrous of that. Like authority, uh, your boss got to where they are by being a stark raving lunatic. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, that you, you're acting like they don't know what they're doing, they don't know what they're talking about half the time, or anybody in authority, you know more, right? If you cannot be told in every arena of life, you can't be taught. So if you cannot be taught, you cannot grow and learn, and therefore you cannot make progress, and you certainly cannot and will not help anybody else. You will just be tearing your own house down with your hands all the time. So we keep adding rooms and floors, if you notice, though, if you didn't lay the needed pipeline, anybody ever have a house or a building, you're like, boy, we sure would love another bathroom in here. But uh, we didn't lay the pipeline for it. So what do we have to do? We have to go back and we have to either jackhammer something up or we have to pour new foundation. We don't get to circumnavigate the process. Now we've all, if you've ever owned a home, you've seen the attempt to circumnavigate the process. Because when you open the wall or the cabinet or the piping, you're like... Oh my gosh, that, that's not even a DIY. That was a DIY, I don't care because I'm selling the house thing. The, uh, the crazy stuff people do and, and they try to hide. So if we didn't lay the needed pipeline, or how about this? We, we, we thought we'd, we'd save 10 bucks and not put a Cat 5 in that room, and now it cost me 150 bucks to get a Cat 5 installed because I decided I want to move the computer from one room to the next, but I could have just gone to the builder, put a Cat 5 in every room because I don't want to be dictated where I move my computer and where I need something hardwired. So uh, prior proper planning, my daddy said, pre prevents poor performance. And, and there are different versions of that saying. <laughs> then we'll, we'll, not, we'll not make them edit it. Okay. But, al but along the way, do we need to keep our pipelines clean? Yes. 
See, what we do is we start letting our faith get weak and think this will just work all by itself. Anybody ever had a pipeline that were like, something's not, something's not right, and you found out it was clogged? Yeah. Anybody ever have a clogged toilet? That's just the visible end of the pipeline clogged. But there, there can be leaves, can, can under the foundation of a house, can roots begin to attack pipelines? Yes. If you go around people's houses and, and they've, they've let foliage become overgrown and things are going under because they didn't maintain. See, acquiring is easy, maintaining is difficult. And they didn't keep things cleaned up, they just let it go on, oh, we'll get to it someday. And things begin to erode. Nature takes back what it's owned. And so you got to keep the pipelines clean. We get them flushed out. If you have a pool and you've got that little drainage and it's flooding, you're like, mm, that drain is clogged because nobody's cleaning it out. And so you got to cut through it and, and get a diamond grinder and it's thousands of dollars and dig it out, make it bigger and redo it and then keep it cleaned out because somebody didn't bother to clean it and things build up and it, you know, like plaque on your teeth if you don't go to the dentist. Things not only build up, they harden and create hard substances. So our pipelines, if they're not maintained, they're not inspected, Hebrew says, give the most earnest heed to these things, lest at any time we let them slip, they'll become cracked and broken and clogged, and then we have a problem. So we turn the water on, and then no water's flowing. Or again, you know, the electricity is just intermittent, or whatever's happening, or termites are beginning to... Um, Treat your house like Fred's buffet. <laughs> You're like, oh, all you can eat buffet. So go to 2 Peter 1 3. So we want to keep those cracks, crack kills, right? We want to, this is how our pipes get broken. We let things slip, we start having doubt, we complain, uh, and we give offenses and receive offenses. Now you have clogged and broken pipelines, and the supply of heaven is not free flowing into your life. Remember that, crack kills. Okay, 2 Peter 1.3 says, According as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through, so here's the key, you have all things given to you that pertain unto life and godliness, but if you don't do part two, you won't access them. Through, What? the knowledge of him that has called you, now you know you're called, to glory and virtue, which means power. Virtue means power. So what do you have to do to have that divine power through the channel of knowledge? So you get in the word and you find out that, that, that the grace pipeline is laid by God, but my part's the faith, so I need to find the faith and start working the faith to get the supply flowing. It's my responsibility to keep the pipeline clear and the water flowing freely. God's responsibility began and end, ended with the grace pipeline. So when we pray for more grace, is that an accurate prayer? No. No. So when Paul said, God, give me more grace, what did God answer him? I didn't lay insufficient pipe, Paul. My grace is sufficient. What he means? It's more than enough. God, I need more grace. You need to do this for me. You need to make this thorn in my side go away. Paul, I gave you the grace. Kind of like, Paul, why aren't you using it? You're not bringing your faith to him. And by the third time, Paul figured that out. So he learned that in life and he wrote it for us so we would know that's the wrong question. And God answered you nicely three times. Paul, you have the keys. Put it in the ignition and turn the switch and it'll work. So Paul just, he learned to go, I can get rid of that thorn in my side. I'll speak to it. I'll take God's word, put it in my mouth. And he was asking God to do his job for him. God will not do your job any more than you could do his. But he, when he asks you and defines yours, he's so good, he's so good he said, I'll give you the, all the ability to do it. That's why you don't have to say no to God. Because when he asks and you think, I can't do that, you need to correct yourself immediately. Well, I couldn't before you asked. But his ask is his grace. So I just have to reach. Paul said, don't fail to reach for the grace. Because God's ask is the offer of grace. Okay, and to tell him you can't or won't you want, you want to think about doing that, okay? In the manner that his miraculous power, force, and abundance has presented us a gift, all things, he said all, that are needed for life, holiness, and the gospel, which is our job, 
right, to preach the gospel, through the recognition and personal acknowledgement of him as our Lord, and that has called us out loud, is what the Greek says. God called you out loud, you need to answer out loud, because words uh, are sound waves, and there's no such thing as silent prayer, because the word prayer means orar, to orate, to speak out loud. So the oration has to go forth, and sound waves move matter, both ways, good or bad. It's, just, it's up to you how, how you want that. Just say what you want to get because boom, it rang. It comes back your way, right? Bring him honor and praise through the dignity of our lives, valor and excellence. So your part is faith and God's part is what? Grace, okay? You're, you're the yes and he's the amen, okay? So you have to contend for it because you will be fought for it. Who's gonna fight you for it? I know what people want to say people, wrong answer. Satan is going to fight you for it. He's going to bid high for your destiny. He's going to offer you the sun, moon, and the stars. In other words, he's going to offer you whatever it takes for you to accept the offer. He's going to bid high. So uh, God says you're going to have to contend for it because you'll be fought for it. But he already told you who your adversary was and that he's under your feet and told you how to keep him there. So it shouldn't be an issue. The, big, the only adversary I have in my life is the one in the mirror. That's good. That's good. I, I camp on God. I know he saved me from hell. Amen. And the devil is under my feet. I, I appreciate that he saved me from me. Yeah, right. And on a daily basis, I focus on God saving me from myself. And by the way, so do everybody else a favor and save them from me too. So grace is the pipeline that must be in place for faith to flow through. But faith is the supply, right? Hebrews 11, one says, and we're almost finished and then I'll take your questions. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So if I have a pipeline in the ground of grace and faith is water flowing through it, when do I see the water, evidence of the water? I don't see it in this pipe underground, do I? But when I turn the faucet on, I believe by faith that when I access the correct method, that water will flow, and I'm surprised if it doesn't. Well, who turned the water off, and I didn't get the memo, and did somebody, you know, cable guy hack into whatever. Um, We got work to do in here, and you're hacking through the water supply. So... uh, We have to access it that way, and we remember that we have to operate the correct mechanism to get that supply flowing. Amen? So faith is the substance. That means that water coming out is the things I'm hoping for. What does that mean? I have things I'm hoping for and believing for, but if I don't let that faith supply flow through the pipeline of grace and send the supply that way, it won't happen. That's why this faith is that substance. Faith is a substance. Water is a substance, but water has a direction. It flows in the path of least resistance. Anybody have a roof leak? It's like there's the leak, but it was coming from way over there in the North 40. It just finds the path of, of least resistance. So it's not difficult to get that faith supply directed where you need it to go Amen. because you just send it the direction of your mouth. I'm talking to my finances. I'm talking to my body. I send the supply very easily everywhere I need it to go. You're directing it, right? Faith is measurable as all substances are. So God has supplied the pipeline. It's in his word. It's like going to Lowe's. (laughs) Got to get some more pipe for that sprinkler system. Uh, And the farther you want your faith to reach, do you need to lay more pipe? Yeah. So when we're like, oh, like our sprinkler system had, I think it was, I don't know if it was four zones or five zones. And he's like, you realize that this, you have a five or six zone box and you only have this on four zones. And some of your issue is this. I said, no, he said, I put in a, another zone and you have five zones to split up now. And you have room for one more. Cause I was saying, if I plant another bed, my concern will be, I won't have the water supply to water that because it will be divided. He said, yeah, that's a great thing to pre think about. Like I can't just dig a hole and put a tree there and hope it'll live unless I feel, really enjoy hauling the hose over there every day, which I usually forget and go, oh, I didn't water for the last two months. Oops, my bad. Only the strong survive in my yard. 
Um, and so what we do is, is we're uh, paying attention to if I go down to Lowe's and go, okay, um, I need the spr- stops here and I need a sprinkler over there. What do I do? Dig a trench, get another piece of pipe, connect it and, and direct the supply out farther so I may have what I want. So when we go, God has provided the grace, it's in his word, whatever I believe and I speak, then I shall have. So I commence to saying what God says and I keep moving that pipeline out farther and farther. Can I have seven zones? We can put another box in. You can have whatever you say. Amen. 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 If you're willing to get the shovel and get to work. So he's the yes. Say, I'm the amen. I am the amen. Or, or I am the so be it. It's, who is it up to if it so be it in your life? Exclusively you. God has said, I, I want it to be that. I've already said yes to you. Here's your part. Now it'll be if you say it. More say, more havey. Less say, no havey, right? Re- really simple. So let's take the word and lay some pipeline, right? in our lives today, tomorrow, the next day. Let's not, we don't need to finish building. The Bible talks about like an edifice higher and higher and from glory to glory. That means change to change. So we want to let God keep expanding that capacity, right? So we're going to lay more pipeline. And how about turning that water flow on every day? You know, what do they tell you? Don't let your pipes just sit. Somebody, if you're not occupying a home, you're, you're, it's your summer home or something, you're going with, hey, somebody needs to come over and run the water and turn the electricity on because dormancy is death. Yes. Yes. So it, things deteriorate when, when you're not moving in them and not living in them and the home has no life in it. A home without life in it is a house and a house deteriorates when it's not cared for. Amen? Amen. So God is the yes and you are the amen. amen. Thank you for joining us today. To learn more about our international ministry and how to become a partner, visit jackmyersministries.com or lifefamilychurch.net.